this. Lesson seven of Miracle Money. Wow. Lesson seven. And this is number three in principles of prosperity. And this will close this part of it. Next week, we're going to look at pitfalls to prosperity. Yes. This is eight tonight? Is it really? Wow. So next week will be nine. Goodness gracious. Good night, Irene. Anyway, um, here we be. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 14. We're going to read verses 18 through 20. And as I say, this is the last in that little sub-series, Principles of Prosperity. This is the third lesson. And then next week, we'll look at pitfalls of prosperity. That'll be from the New Testament. But today, we're in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. Interesting little story, and um, can't necessarily answer all your questions, probably. It's a bit of a conundrum regarding this mysterious Melchizedek. But we'll, uh, we'll look at it. Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he, speaking of Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. This is the sixth church that I have served as pastor. Longest one, of course, 30 years, uh, last December. Uh, but in one church I pastored, I found it very interesting. My associate pastor and I were both uh, to be given a raise. They had promised us a raise, the board of that church, numerous times. And we kept every board meeting, when they were quarterly, we kept expecting them to say, among other business, you know, we'll be implementing, implementing the raise we promised you, et cetera, et cetera. Never happened. And uh, the, the, the story always was, well, you know, we're just not doing as well as we should be, and we can't quite do that. Of course, I was the pastor. I knew otherwise. My treasurer told me exactly what was going on. He and I would meet, and I would kind of tell him what bills to pay. So I knew that wasn't accurate. Uh, but I thought, well, maybe they still know something that I don't know. Uh, and I let it go. And I found it fascinating. They turned us down for the raise. I think within, within a day during one of the services, the air conditioning unit went out in the church. And it was the funniest thing. That was fixed in one day. They, they found the money some way to fix the air conditioning for the building. <laughs> but they couldn't seem to find that money for our raise, which wouldn't have mounted to the air conditioning unit, I don't think, in a year. In any case, it kind of pointed out that it would appear they were valuing themselves and the building more than they were valuing the men of God, the men of God that were giving them spiritual oversight. Can I tell you nothing much has changed in 2,000 years because, or longer because it was happening in Bible days as we're going to see when we look at Malachi. Mentioned last week we would be talking finally, lesson 8, uh, about tithing tonight. We talked about giving in general last time and tithing tonight. And I hope you have a pen or pencil or something to write with because some of the verses, not a lot of them, but some of the verses you might want to look up on your own. I, uh, otherwise, I'm just going to give you the references tonight. I want to look at two things in this portion of Scripture. The first thing I want us to look at is the concept of the blessing and the blesser or the one doing the blessing, the one receiving and the one doing the blessing. And then secondly, I want to look with you regarding the truth about tithing. And I say truth because I think you'll see with me, um, it's not necessarily understood the way the Bible teaches it. I, I got to tell you up front, as always, when I do something in the Word, I'm not giving you any opinions tonight. I'm not giving you, well, I think it's this. I'm, I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm just going to give you Scripture because I think that's the only thing we can really trust. Amen? We've got to have spiritual concrete under our feet. It's got to be thus saith the Lord, or as the Reformation reminded us, sola scriptura. So the blessing and the blesser, and we, we begin uh, by just reminding you, if you haven't read the, the preceding verses, this story tonight that we just quoted is the finale of a military um, uh, push that Abraham had gotten involved in. We don't think of Father Abraham as a warrior, do we? But he really did have at least one, one um, excursion into warfare. Uh, he had about 300 people that, that were under his charge. And uh, it's the, the, what would you say, the 
aftershocks of his war against four heathen kings. Why would he get involved? Uh, because among other things that they had done, they had kidnapped his nephew Lot and his family and all of their stuff. And so Abraham got involved to rescue his nephew. And he was just now returning from the, spoils, uh, from the war with the spoils of the war when a, an unusual guy shows up that uh, is a priest king, if you will, one man standing in two offices uh, named Melchizedek. I was telling Barb earlier, it's kind of interesting when you look at the New Testament references, uh, they're in uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and again chapter 7. He's called uh, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. I don't know why it's different. They don't even use a zeta because there's that letter Z, but they use a sigma. But this is the way that uh, your Savior and mine and the early church would have pronounced this man's name because they were reading from the um, 70, from the Greek version, so they would have referred to him as Melchizedek. But in any case, his name comes from uh, two Hebrew words. One, Melek is king. The other word is the word for righteousness. So you could, you could say his name means either uh, righteousness is king or the most important thing, or you would say he is the king of righteousness. And um, he's called um, uh, Vasilevs, king of Salim. Uh, which the, the place that later became Jerusalem. And he's also called an Ireps in the New Testament, uh, which is priest. So this is one man holding two offices. He was a king of what would be called, what would become Jerusalem. And he was also serving as a priest. And it's interesting, a priest of the Most High God. This is kind of fascinating because we're not talking about the time of Leviticus or Numbers or the time of the kings. We're talking about Genesis, okay, before there was even the Le 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 Levitical priesthood. And so back then, we've got this guy that kind of comes out of nowhere, and he announces himself as the, the uh, priest, not just of El, you know, or God, but uh, of the Most High God, which would be, of course, uh, Yahweh. Now, I say he's mysterious. We don't know a lot about him. Uh, one thing that I found in one of my commentaries is, is there's a reference to him in something called the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. It's dated about a hundred or so years before the time of Christ. Uh, and in that writing, there's an expectation of two different messianic figures. One was to be from the priestly line of Levi, and one was to be from the royal line of Judah. And uh, fragments in Cave 11 at Qumran, you've heard of Qumran? Um, in, uh, and, and this was another writing, uh, that's about 50 A.D., uh, represent him as the champion deliverer of the Jewish people. And they were going to um, uh, expect him to kind of almost be a messianic figure. And some rabbis actually saw in him and attributed to him the functions that elsewhere were ascribed to the archangel Michael. So this is kind of a mysterious dude, this uh, Melchizedek. In any case, um, the, uh, there's another uh, mention of him in another one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There, uh, in this other writing, he was seen to be a kind of heavenly judge. And his job was basically to condemn and judge Satan and all of the evil spirits that worked with him. So talk about a guy that gets around in terms of extra biblical writing and of course those are not the bible so we really can't trust that there's another one that you probably heard of uh, and that is a gnostic text from a book called the nag hammadi texts and it says in there that some new testament believers um, saw him as christ in other words they basically considered melchizedek the same personage as the angel of the covenant, who we know was Jesus, they see Melchizedek in the same way. However, I've got to say, these were Gnostic believers, Gnostic Christians who were heretics. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to take any doctrine from somebody that doesn't even believe the truth of the Bible about the Savior. Uh, they didn't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, etc. But they had this, this view. And to me, it's unfortunate that some Christian teachers kind of buy into that, and they see in Melchizedek 
Christ, literally Christ in a pre-incarnate visitation. There was still another view. Some rabbis said, now this Melchizedek is actually Shem that we read about in the Old Covenant. And if you, if you play with the, the lineage and the genealogies, you can kind of see that Shem could have been alive at this time. But Bible genealogies, the way they are, don't always include every particular person and ancestor. So, you know, again, you're kind of on, on iffy ground. Would you perhaps agree with me tonight that it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, who he was really? But we want to think of what the Bible actually says. Whoever he was in terms of his genealogy, he definitely was the king of what became Jerusalem, and he definitely was a priest of El Elyon, God, God Most High. Uh, and this is where we read this today in, in Genesis 14, 18 and following. Melchizedek, king of Salem, he brought out bread and wine, and he was priest, again, of El El Yon. And he was blessing him, meaning Abram. And he, Melchizedek, the priest king, was saying, Blessed be Abram of El El Yon. And blessed be El El Yon, creator of heaven and earth. So here he's definitely identifying the God he serves as Yahweh, the one true God. And blessed be El El Yon, having delivered your enemies in your hand. And so the priest king is the blesser, and the one receiving the blessing is Abram. And notice the last phrase here, Genesis 14, 18 through 20, the last phrase. And he, speaking of Abram, was giving to him the tithe from all. So we don't know what the spoils included, but it was a lot of stuff. We know that because he's conquered four different kings. And he gives this priest king tenth a tithe of all the spoils of war could have included animals foodstuffs could have been silver gold precious stones raiment clothing who knows but he gave this priest king the tithe so this is very important for us to get why because of something in the bible called the law of first mention anytime a person a concept a doctrine, a belief, a teaching appears for the first time in the Bible, we need to pay attention to it because it kind of sets the stage for what that will mean down the road. This is the very first mention of tithing in the Bible, and we see that the tithe was given, in this case, uh, not just from normal income, Abram's normal livestock uh, job, but it was given as from spoils of war, but still something that belonged to the man of God. And where was it given? Was it used to build a chapel or a building for El Elyon? Was it used to bless Lot for punishment he had received at the hands of these heathen kings? Was it used for Abraham's other family members? What was the tithe used for? Where did it go? What did, what did Abram do with it? He gave it to a man, didn't he? He gave it to a minister, a priest king. Where do tithes go today? <laughs> yeah, Mark says the church, not just the church. No, pay your money, take your choice. I've talked to people, and I've been at this a little while, 40, over almost 44 years this fall. I've talked to people of all different stripes re related to different religions, uh, shouldn't say religions, denominations, church groups, faith groups, ministries. You'd be surprised where their tithes go. I I've heard this on more than one occasion. Well, you know, one thing about it, I don't give my, my tithes to the church anymore. I kind of just give them wherever I feel led. One of my, you know, in-laws or outlaws needs some help. I'll just give them my tithe. Or, you know, if my house needs some work, I'll just use the tithe to fix my house. Or, you know, if I've got a relatives in hard times, I'll just give them my tithe. Or any of a number of other uses I've heard for the tithe. Well, what's the truth about tithing? What should we be using it for? According to the law of first mention, it went to a person, to a priest king named Melchizedek. Now, let's move along. Abram practiced tithing. Would you agree? He gave him 10% from all that he brought back from that 
uh, war that he won. Abram practiced tithing. His grandson, Jacob, promised tithing. How many have read that? Genesis 28. Remember when, when Jacob vowed a vow unto Yahweh? He said, if you'll protect me, if you'll be with me going out, if you'll keep me fed and clothed and bring me back safe, of all that I got, gather, of all that I'm blessed with, I will surely give you the tenth. Have you searched the scripture to see whether he made good on it? The Bible doesn't say. We assume that he did. Why am I bringing that up? For the simple reason that we don't know where he was going to send that tithe. There was no temple back then, was there? No. We don't know what Jacob would have done at that point. We don't know to whom he would have given his tithe. But I'm simply saying Abram, his granddad, practiced it, and Jacob promised it. You see, it's Genesis 28, 20, and 21. You see how I'm saying it's important, the law of first mention? That concept of blessing the Lord with the first fruits, the tenth of your increase, must have been an oral tradition handed down. Abram did it. Jacob promised it. We don't know whether he followed through. Moving forward, it was part of the law. And in the law, to whom did the tithes go? Well, obviously to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, no. To build the temple, no. To help someone's relatives, no. Where did the tithes go in the book of Leviticus? To the Levites, Numbers 18, verses 21 through 24. Again, they went to people, ministers, Numbers 18, 21 through 24. Secondly, in the law, tithes went to priests, Numbers 18.24. And the Bible speaks in Leviticus not about if you tithe, but when you tithe. So it was given that it was going to take place, and it just told you how to do it and to whom the tithes went. In addition to this, the Levites who received the tithes of Israel were to tithe on the tithes. Isn't that something? So they would give a tenth of what they received, the tenth of the people. They gave a tenth of the tenth to Aaron and his successors, Eleazar and so on. The high priests. Uh, <clears throat> I find it fascinating that this concept does not hold true today, does it? No. We do not have, well, first of all, ministers don't get tithes. The church gets the tithe and the minister gets a salary. And everything that the church does and has is all coming out of the tithes of the membership. I know of only one organization that actually suggests that the minister should receive the tithes completely and then should tithe on the tithes. Only one organization I know of that suggests that. They're still in business as far as I know. You'd expect somebody would have put them out of business by now because... For some reason, some people don't like that concept. But here it is again, Numbers 18.28, the tithe of the tithes goes where? Well, surely that goes to the temple upkeep, right? And the, the, the bread for the, you know, the, the, the show bread and all the candles and this and that and all the, all the stuff that's required, the anointing oil and the fire and the animals. No, it went to the priests, to the high priests, and think about this, every three years, Deuteronomy 14, 27 through 29, it went to the ministers, again, and Levites, and the poor. And I'd have to study this out. I haven't. It's not a big deal to me. But I wouldn't be surprised if the poor there refers to the poor or the poorest of the Levites. Because everywhere else in the Old Covenant, beginning with Genesis 14, Tithes go to people, particular people, not your relatives or mine or somebody else or Sister Hope and Diddle because we take an ocean, she deserves the tithes. No, it all goes to the support of the ministry. People, not programs. How many have heard of Malachi 3.10? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, right? Some preachers wear that one out. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. For what purpose? Thanks, Charlie. That there may be food in my house. Let me ask you a question. Who was the food for? Yeah. 
the food, all those animals, were for the support of the priests and their families. It's not for the building. It's not for the walls, not for new lights, new carpeting, fixing the air conditioner. It's for people. Even the, the verse that some preachers ride a hobby horse on never mention this. At least I don't hear it. They just talk about bringing it into the church, the ministry. Well, yeah, that's where it should be. But why? So, let's, so that there's meat in my house. And Malachi, speaking for Yahweh, was a little upset, wasn't he? You're cursed with a curse. I'm glad there's an article there, aren't you? You're cursed with the curse. In other words, you're not cursed going to hell. You're cursed with the curse of not being blessed financially because you're not bringing the tithes to the storehouse because basically you're cheating God's men of their supply. Why? God's concerned about whom? People. People. God loves people. Buildings and everything physical is secondary, right? Very important. Now, in addition to this, there was another, uh, there was another tithe that was, in a sense, spread over three years. Now, whether people actually held back a third of their increase in addition to their tithe each year or not, or just added another tithe, I don't know. But every three years, there was another tithe, and I've already mentioned that. That went to the poorest of the poor and the Levites again. Well, someone says, well, wait a minute. If that's what they were doing, well, how in the world did they build temples? How did they keep the, the temple in the kind of situation it was supposed to be? How did they supply all the things that it needed? There was a temple tax, wasn't there? Yeah, it was a half shekel tax, which is about two days wages, that every uh, male above the 20 and above would pay once a year. And usually at one of the three big feasts like Passover or uh, Tabernacles or Pentecost, they would pay this half shekel uh, tax fee. This is the one that, that they asked Jesus about. They asked Peter, does your teacher pay the temple tax? He was already behind. It was overdue. And he said, yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> let, me, let me see. I'll get back to you on that. And Jesus, of course, already knew what he was going to do. So he, uh, he brought Peter the information that he needed uh, to tell the people collecting and, and then also told Peter how to get the money. How many remember that story? We wear that one out, don't we? And we ought to. That's, that's miracle money if I ever heard of it. Now, when you move out from the law, you find that in the time of Jesus, our Lord affirmed the practice of tithing. In Matthew 23, 23, he kind of brought the legalistic Jewish folk up short because they were paying tithes on, on their little gardens. I mean, they had it down to a science. Everything that was anything of importance to them, they tithed on. And yet he said, you've left out the weight, weightier matters of the law, like love and mercy and forgiveness and compassion. You should be doing those without leaving the others undone. So Jesus clearly during his earthly ministry uh, believed in the concept of tithing to bless the ministry of Yahweh. Well, okay, but pastor, Genesis 14, that's Abraham, Old Covenant. The law, that's Israel, Old Covenant. Uh, the time of Christ, the Old Covenant was still in force un until Jesus died. Old Covenant. But what, what about us? What about today? What's the truth about tithing? Sister Hoopmanetti told me, she read where, you know, you just give us, just give as you desire. Just, you know, whatever you, you take a notion. And it said, for, it said, it's in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 16. You know, well, she taught you wrong. What about the New Testament and tithing? There's a verse that I commend to your uh, attention. And it's one that, that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Has anybody read that lately? It's, a, it's an interesting portion of Scripture because Jesus had earlier in the Gospels sent his uh, apostles out and said that they should be taken care of. Amen? He said, uh, don't work for your keep. In other words, don't be bivocational. You go out, preach the word, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. Freely you've received from me. Now you freely give. And then he said, don't take anything with you. Don't take an extra set of shoes. Don't take a money belt. Don't take any money, no gold, no silver. Uh, uh, don't take a walking stick. 
the laborer is worthy of his wage. So basically what he was saying is everything that a natural, normal human person needs to make it in this life is, is you're entitled to, but you don't have to work for it. It should be given to you by those you minister to. Amen? Well, Paul made this a little clearer. Uh, after the ministry of Christ, after the 12, after the 70, New Testament ministers that we have today. Let me give you the verse. Because a lot of Christians wonder, well, is there anything specifically mentioning tithing in the New Testament after the Gospels? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's talking about how he and Barnabas did not take support from their listeners as they did itinerant, traveling, apostolic ministry. He said, we were entitled to it, but we didn't take it. We, we worked, you know, he was a tent maker, I don't know what Barnabas did, and, and we kind of made our own way most of the time, not always, but most of the time, especially when we were pioneering a new work. Uh, and, and yet he says, we could have done. Now listen to what Paul says about this. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing? If we shall reap your carnal or natural things? If others, meaning other ministers, be partakers of this authority over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this authority, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now here it is. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar that's talking about the priest isn't it verse 14 even so or in exactly the same way hath the lord ordained and it means he's charged or commanded it's not a suggestion even so hath the lord ordained that they which preach the gospel are living out of the gospel now, when he said, even so, what Paul did there was bring tithing into the New Testament. And did you notice where the tithes were going in his mind? Building the synagogue? Helping the person whose tithing's relatives? Their friends? Somebody they feel like blessing? No. Didn't go to buildings. It went to people and not any old person but the minister, the ministers of the gospel. So this is a principle of prosperity, to recognize that the tithe is a blessing to God's representatives, his king priests, if you will, on planet earth. Do you recall when I said earlier in the old covenant that the Levites who received the tithes tithed on the tithes and they gave the tenth of the tenth to the high priest? Did you notice that doesn't happen today? That ought to tell us something, shouldn't it? In other words, there is no high priest in the body of Christ. There is no spiritual line where some ministers are second-class citizens, and then you've got not just bishops, but archbishops, and maybe one big shot, you know, whether it's a patriarch of, of one area or the pope over in Rome or whatever. We, we don't have any of that in the New Testament. We don't see Peter... Uh, tithing to James. He was, Peter was a member of the Jerusalem church. James was the pastor, but we don't find Peter giving his tithe to James. Why? Because that structure no longer exists, regardless of what some denominations may think, preach, or practice. That concept of, of an apostolic succession does not appear in the New Testament. I find that interesting. That was abrogated, Right? So was the lineage business. How many remember in the time of the priests when Jeroboam made his own worship service, had his own altars? How many remember he ordained his own priests? And the true priest said, how dare you? Where is your lineage? We can show you who we're related to. It was, you know, they had big lists of names. And this one, this one, this one, this one. We do not have that in the New Testament, do we? No. Because it's not carnal. It's not based on the flesh. It's not based on where your name's written or who you're kin to or who laid hands on you. There's no such thing in the New Testament. The calling doesn't come from people. It comes from God. And ordination simply affirms what God has already done. It doesn't impart it. Anybody that's honest and has access to God's Greek New Testament will have to admit that's the case. Ordained just means to publicly set apart. To publicly set apart, it has nothing to do with something spiritual being imparted or some kind of mystical transfer. 
That's absolutely foreign to the scripture. There is not scripture an inch long that teaches that. I find that fascinating. The word has a way of clearing this kind of stuff up, doesn't it? If we don't add to it. The last time we see this kind of thing, and I've mentioned this before, is Galatians, for example, chapter 6, 6 through 10. There it says, teachers should be supported by their students. And we should not be weary in this matter of well-doing, that is the support of the ministry. In due season we'll reap if we're not feigning. I, can't, I could keep you here all night telling you how God blessed me when I blessed the man or the woman of God. And I'm sure you can testify in the same way. It's a principle. It's a divine principle. Jesus promised at Matthew 10, 41, he said, if you even give a cup of cold water to one of my servants, you'll absolutely not lose your reward, either here or hereafter. So this is why we're calling it a principle of prosperity. And like we said last week, the beautiful thing about giving is it's not confined to this life. It keeps on going. It keeps on acting. It keeps on multiplying. The last one we see in the New Testament is 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. There, Paul tells his young protege, elders, bishops, pastors, whichever word you want to use, same office, who rule well, rule, rule well or oversee the congregation well, should be worthy of double honor. What does that mean? Two handshakes instead of one? Two pats on the back? It means literally double stipend or double pay. It doesn't necessarily say give it to them. It says they should be considered worthy of twice what they normally get. It, why? It says especially those who toil in teaching. Read it sometime. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Especially those who toil in teaching. What's that mean? It means things haven't changed. You know preachers, I'm sure, or have been maybe sat under some, that just get by. They don't really study. They don't really seek the Lord. They don't really ask God what he wants the people to know. They don't wrestle with difficult scripture to hopefully help people understand things that they don't understand. They just kind of cruise. They kind of get by or maybe buy their messages off the internet or steal them from someone, I mean, borrow them from someone else. Um, well, those aren't the kind that are worthy of a double pay, but those who toil at it, um, yeah, maybe they should be given something besides the normal uh, support. But the bottom line of this is, it's a principle of prosperity. Do you ever ask yourself why? One minister says, giving is the only proof that we have conquered greed. That's something to think about. Here, here I think, is another reason it's a principle of prosperity. Whether it's offerings or tithes, when we choose to give even when it might be difficult, sometimes it is, when we choose to honor the word and honor from the law first mentioned all the way through the law, the time of Christ, the epistles, and, and today. When we choose to live in, light, in the light of that, what we're basically saying is, I'm going to give up the scene, the money, the 10%. I'm going to give that up as an act of faith that I believe in the unseen. It's a way to exercise faith. It's like someone coming to a man or woman of God and receiving anointing with oil for healing. They're saying, I'm going to not trust natural human medicine. There's nothing wrong with it, but they're saying at that point, I'm not looking to natural means. I'm looking to the invisible power of the Spirit of God and the merit of of the invisible blood of Jesus, which I cannot see, but is in heaven. Even when I take the Lord's uh, blood in communion, I don't see it. I take it by faith that there's something there besides juice, right? It's I'm trusting the unseen. And I think that's the real key, perhaps one of the main keys of this concept of, of whether it's giving to the poor, like we talked about last week, uh, giving to one another, or whether it's actually support of the ministry, I think that's one of the main reasons it's important and why it's such a blessing. It is an act of faith. It's natural to hold on. Like for a rainy day. Some people say if you do that, you might get the rainy day. I don't know about that. But it's, it, rather than hold on to the seen, we trust the unseen and we prove that by letting go, by doing opposite what we think. Right? 
what's natural. It's natural to hold on and try to get more to add to it. It's unnatural to let go. I think one reason God is blessing our ministry, our fellowship and our ministry, so much is the amount of giving we do. You know, uh, I've, got, I've gotten letters and emails from people that have been to seminary, and they've said they learn more in our one, two, or three courses than they did when they went to seminary, you know? Uh, and so it, it's worth probably thousands of dollars in terms of schooling, but we're, we're giving it away. You know, you probably see them on TV. I'm not for or against it. I'm just saying you see people selling CD sets, selling DVDs, and so on. We don't do that. We just give the downloads away, give the CDs away. They maybe pay the postage. Uh, same with books. And I'm, I'm thinking that's one reason I believe we get surprised with these sometimes strange, unusual gifts that come from places we didn't expect. Um, I think God's basically saying this thing works. You're, you're doing it, you're working it, and I'll be a debtor to no man. You're exercising faith rather than holding on, you're letting go, and I, I, I bless that. Just like Abram was blessed by Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. S uh, help anybody tonight? S yeah, Charlie. Oh, just what you just said. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But it takes faith. Oh, yeah. It takes I know a lot of ministers that are bivocational. I'm not for or against it. I preached and preached and worked for years. But I'm, I'm simply saying some just never go full time, even when they know God wants them to. Why? Because it takes faith. If I freely give, in other words, don't really look to the church to, to support me, trust God. Well, then what? You know, well, you're proving that you believe what God said, uh, that he's going to touch the hearts of your people or someone else that you minister to. Maybe it's not even one-on-one -on -one there. Anybody else? Thought-provoking or not? And I, can, I, can, I give you a little, can I give you a little surprise? I don't live on the tithes here. Have you figured that one out? No. Uh, thank God I have a salary, but uh, that's as far as I know, it's not done anywhere. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. So we get the point, the main point, that God is interested in people. And I think that's what I wanted, wanted to remind us of tonight. That blesses me. God's interested in people. He wants us to bless people. He wants us to bless the ministry, which are people. And uh, in Bible days, buildings and so on were taken care of by a tax, uh, in addition to the tithes that went to support God's people. So what I'm saying is a church like that I mentioned earlier, a church that denies ministry what they were promised and then finds money to fix the air conditioner, I don't think that that's pleasing for, to God because he's concerned about people and not just the people in the pew, the people in the ministry too. Make sense? So, anybody? Input, output? No, interesting enough, it doesn't. Yeah, it's gone. But uh, <clears throat> I think the Lord wants to bless us, you know? He wants to bless us. Next week, we're going to look at something I find extremely fascinating in something that P uh, Paul said to Timothy regarding a pitfall to prosperity. It's kind of the opposite of tonight, but it's very interesting how Paul describes the contrast to the giving of living, the kind of person or people, and, and, and we'll see next week particularly ministers who are more interested in taking than sharing more interested in withdrawing than making a deposit. And it's very interesting how he describes the lifestyle. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to step into a pothole if I can eliminate it, if I can avoid it. And so that's what we're going to look at next week. It's basically two, two pitfalls of prosperity, and we'll look at that. We're going to come around the Lord's table. If you're giving tonight, that's great. We appreciate it. Um, God has just been fantastic. Did you see the bulletin that we went over a little bit over our budget for, for, for the week? That's fantastic because the, the previous Sunday, our offering was about $500, and 100 of that had come through the mail, so the actual service, about $400, and uh, they're not here so I can embarrass them. One person actually gave $300 of that. So you think, well, huh, this is interesting. This isn't even a third of the budget. From Sunday to the following Thursday, it went from 500 to almost another $2,000. You, you can't make that up. You can't figure it out. It's, you would assume it's crazy. But 
I, I find it fascinating that we're in the middle of this series, and I don't, I don't teach much on this, but uh, this is when some unusual things have been happening. So um, I say the best is yet to come. Amen? <laughs>